98% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level four with depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro black philosophers the BGF the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church hide knives up in a bible Political and tribal the Crips and Damus The Long Beast the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE the Bakersfield the day go pop rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose you better stick to it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation yard down you already know what it is today man we got another interview man we got another uh another good brother coming through man um i'm uh, honored and privileged to have him on my show he goes by the name of primo the general man and he's uh well, matter of fact, I'm going to let him tell you guys where he's from and all that type of stuff. So, uh, hey, Primo, holla at him, man. How you doing, man? My name is Primo the General, man. I'm up out of Oak Park, California. And for those, who, uh, you know, for those of you guys not familiar with uh, with California or whatever, he's from he's from Sacramento, man. Um, the first uh, first brother from his area that I'm um, interviewing on my on my channel. So that's that's uh, that's a privilege. And people are always interested in different parts of uh california and different cars and this and that so uh you know he's a um former blood um he did about 16 years he got a real interesting story and like i say man i'm honored to have him on my have him on my channel so uh primo man why don't you uh tell us a little bit about yourself and how you grew up i mean you know what i mean i grew up as a typical youngster in the hood you know what i mean i grew up in old park you know what i'm saying and it was Basically, get out, you know, being a bad kid, you know, to run in the mill, follow behind my brothers and my cousins, you know what I mean, doing everything I thought was the flyest thing to do because what my brothers was doing and what I was seeing in front of me. So, you know, I had a typical upbringing, you know, gang banging, you know what I mean, shootouts and juvenile hall and, you know what I mean, boys' ranch camps and all that old type of upbringing. So, I had an upbringing that everybody, you know, everybody's probably wasn't the same, but I went to just start going to juvenile hall when I was 10 years old. So, I jumped off the porch real early, so my upbringing was kind of rough. And okay, and so me myself, I'm not too familiar with with uh, Oak Park. So is that a is that a section of is that a section of Sacramento, or that's its own city? No, nah, it's Oak Park. Is we in the middle? We just in Midtown. You know what I mean? So you know what I mean? You can get you don't hear Murder Midge, you don't hear Oak Park. You know what I mean? So it's so the it, middle. It, it's like it's not south. It's not east. It's not north. It's the middle. So you gotta. It's in the middle of Sacramento. Oh, okay. So it's, it's just a part of Sacramento then. This is a big part. This is in the middle. Right. Okay. Okay. And so um you said that you had some some brothers and sisters, or or did you just have brothers and and where did you where did you fall in, in, in that line of siblings? Were you like, you know, the the oldest, the youngest? Uh how did that work for you? It was six of it was six of us, so it was four boys and two girls. I'm the youngest boy. Oh you know what okay. I mean? so it was only it was only one person younger than me was my little sister Precious, and everybody else is older than me. Right. So, so I'm, I'm number five out of six. I'm, I'm number I'm number four of the boys. I'm the fourth boy out of the six. So was any was any of your brothers? Did they later on become affiliated and, and join the gangs and stuff? I mean, when it all started, my big brother Willie Bobo is, which is my older brother. You know, what I mean, he a legendary old Park Fourth Avenue. You don't hear the boy Mozzie rap about him and all that. So my brother represents Fourth Avenue. You know what I mean? So it's like I was born into it. My big brother represents Fourth Avenue. My older brother under him represents Old Park. My brother right above me, he represents Old Park 33rd. So me up under him, I represent Old Park 33rd. So it's like it was like passed down. It was like all my brothers was in the game. Right. So okay. And so by you having three older brothers who was um, you know, who was who was representing the neighborhood, what was that like growing up for you having older brothers? I'm sure that they, you know, went through these type of little um episodes which they would call themselves trying to toughen you up. So, you know, um, Basically, I'm trying to say I'm like you and you just said that type of mentality was pretty much passed down from you probably from the time you was four or five years old they in the backyard teaching you how to fight or in the garage or whatever. So how was how was that? I learned I learned, I learned how to fight from my big brothers, my big cousin, Corey, you know what I mean? So I learned how to, they made sure I was ready for the streets before I left the house. So my upbringing was different in a lot. Like I said, I used to be in the middle of the ring with my brothers with the boxing gloves. While my, all my older brothers sat around, you know, what I mean, gambling on who the little two little brothers who going to win. 
You know what I mean? So we 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 was fighting. He was like, you know what I mean? To go with them, I had to fight to go. They wasn't trying to take me with them. I'm the little brother. Nobody wants the little brother running around behind them. So right. to show them I was willing to be with them, I had to go put in some work. I had to let them know, like you, I'm not no, I'm not no uh, liability. Like I can hold my own. Right. So they was making sure I was ready. So I did. Uh, we had a good upbringing with the uh, with the fighting and all the back and forth with each other. And so, like many of us men in this gang, in this gang environment, you know. We um, at some point in our lives, we feel a need to to be accepted by whoever, whether it's our older brothers or it's our older homies. And sometimes in this lifestyle, man, um, acceptance come from, you know, acts, acts of violence, being being down to fight and stuff like that. Do you feel that that if, if that was your case, that played a role in who you turned out to be uh, later on, you know, in, in gang banging life? Because, you know, for those who've never gang bang, it's sad, but it's true, man. I mean, being violent is is. It's part of that lifestyle, you know. Either you at some point, either you're gonna be the bully or you're gonna get bullied. You know, you really can't be no weak gang member. At some point, you're gonna have to participate in violence, and a lot of times, more than not, you're gonna have to be the aggressor. So, how was that mm-hmm. for you? I mean, I kind of got it handed down easy because, like I said, I got to watch three generations before me. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I got to see, like, you know what I mean? Like before, like you know, before I can go with them, they made sure I was ready to go. You know what I mean? So. The fighting part, I had to know how to defend myself, so I had to go catch some phase with the little people down the street, like you say, the little dudes down the block. They had to go see me fight, you know what I mean? They had to make sure that I was ready. So that was like I really just like it was like it was just passed down from generation to generation. So it was like I watched my brother go; he made it to college, you know what I mean? And my next brother made it to pros. It's like so now it's like I got to follow him and go to the pros too. So it was like it was just passed down to me. Okay, so you had you had a brother that made it to pros. Was it football, basketball? No, no. I'm just saying. I'm just putting that in the. I'm just putting that in the in the, oh. in, the in the theory of that. You know what I mean? Like in the way that followed the pattern. Like you just see, like if I was, my brother played football, his oh, little right. brother probably gonna play football too. You know what I'm saying? Right, okay, he's trying to okay, follow okay. his big brother. Just so an just analogy. Saying, okay. was, there you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's basically right. that's the way it was. I followed my brothers. All my brothers was game. Like I say, my brother was a legendary Fourth Avenue gang member. You know what I mean? So. I seen it all. Like as a little kid, I'd have been at the parties. I was a part of all of that. So you know, I me mean, before I was old enough to even know how to do it, I was around it. So it was it just came second nature. Like it was just handed down to me. Like like going off to school like your brother did. Right. And then so earlier mm-hmm. I heard you mention that you had went to juvenile hall at ten years old. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Wow. With my brothers and them, stealing bikes. You know what I mean, being bad, old park. So that's that's extremely. I mean, that's extremely young to start going to juvenile hall. What was that experience for you? And, and how often did you go? Did you just go that one time or, or was going to juvenile hall something that you that unfortunately you 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 uh, you did often? Yeah, I did. I, I went I'm from 1990 all the way to 1997. You know what I'm saying? I was in and out of juvenile hall or some kind of a boys ranch or a camp. So it was like the first time I went when I was 10 years old, you would think it would probably make the 10 year old scared. But to me, it wasn't. They had foosball in there. You know what I'm saying? We in the dorms with the people that we know. So they sound like they made it fun. So it wasn't nothing that really scared me to return back. Mm-hmm. So I think that kind of like what really wasn't, it wasn't like nothing that was scary. Like if I go to juvenile hall, I'm going to see all the people that I knew that I haven't seen in a little while. So it wasn't like, it was nothing that scared me. So it was like, I went, like I say, from 1990, then I went to MAC in 92. I went to girls school in 93, went to boys ranch, you know what I'm saying? 96 and 97. And then on off to the penitentiary in 2000. So it was like, it was less, just like the same chain reaction of like you talking about follow suit. My brother went to the PN. My other brother went to the PN. My big brother went to the PN. Like, we all, I don't know, it's kind of like it's the same way I just put that analogy. Like, I just seemed like it was a follow-suit kind of a setup. Wow. And and so you you hopped off the porch early around the age of 10, and you started going back and forth to Juvenile Hall. But at what age would you say you officially started, you know, representing your neighborhood and banging, you know, being a blood? Right when I was 10 years old, right? I was already trying to do it before I even knew how to do it at 10 years old. But when, when I when I went to Juvenile Hall, they was already knowing I was primo from Oak Park. I was from 33rd. Right. Like I say, my big brother was from 33rd. My big cousin's from 33rd. So I was, like I say, I was idolizing anything they was doing. That was tight to me. That was the, that was the it thing to do. Right. And so, so I, when I was often, 10 years old, I already considered myself a gang man. Mm-hmm. And, and I often ask a lot of dudes this, so... Um, how was your initiation process? Did you have to be put on the hood or by your brother? Like you say, starting the gang, was you automatically in because your brother was a reptile? Yeah, see, it was just like DNA. It's like it's like I had no choice on none of this. Like this was already inherited to me. Like, you know what I mean? When I came out and came home, it was I was understood and it had to be explained. So like I didn't get jumped on, nobody never put their hands on me. It's like my brother is from here, my right. cousin is from here. I'm with them every day. This is where I'm from. We live in the same house. 
Right. So you know what I'm saying? Our address is on 33rd. We live on 33rd Street. You know what I mean? It would have been easy for me to bank 4th Avenue. If you really know my hood, my whole family is from 4th Avenue. 4th Avenue is the most predominantly the biggest street in Oak Park. My whole family is from that street. Mm-hmm. But me and my brothers, we really lived on 33rd. So it's like I could have hooked up with what my, what my family was over there doing. But me and my brothers and my cousin, we did what we was doing over here. So we banked 33rd because that's where we really lived at. So we was right. already being like different in our family off top. Like we would only only 33rd side of the family, everybody else and my whole family is from 4th Avenue. Mm-hmm. And so basically that was that was your birthright. Because that's where I lived at. If my mom would have lived on that side by my grandma, then it would probably would have been different. But my mom lived over here on this side of the piece. So this is what we're doing. And so for you, what what um what age do you feel that you know gang banging and, and the beats that come with gang banging really got serious for you in 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 uh in terms of violence and stuff like that? Probably like 95. Like 95 when I got like to be like 15, when I got to be more and finding myself in these streets. Mm-hmm. Now just think that's a long five years from 10 to 15, you know, any street life, that's a lot. You done went through a whole lot in them little five years from being 10 to 15. Right. So I, I thought I was a little more, a little more grown. I started participating a little more, whether I should say hardcore activities. And uh, if some of it started to come back to bite me and a couple of them almost caught me in a bad situation. So I think probably when I was about 15 years old, that's when it really started getting aggressive and playing with the weapons and doing that type of stuff. And and so for those of us who are not familiar with Sacramento, what's the gang makeup like in Sacramento in terms of uh, Crips and Bloods? Is it more is it more a uh blood dominated city is it more crip dominated city uh how does that how does that work well really it's it's, it's mostly dominated by blood because everything mostly in sacramento is red rag you know what i mean whether it's the bloods the blacks the mexicans you know what i mean so the asians so everything mostly bang red rag so then you know there is crips out here you know what i mean shout out to my crips you know what i mean i got a lot of love for the key ways up out of sacramento so you know it's like it's 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 not close but you know what i mean they 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 put they mark enough they represented enough to where you know what i mean they they mark is met they mark is felt you know what i mean they out here but they ain't no they ain't deep as us though right and so now is, is sacramento you know um considered uh northern california is that is that uh how are you guys geographically especially like when you i mean they just are. consider us up north because i mean you know then you got the little you got the bay area then you got this part of the thing too so this would be considered up north too so instead of them, like basically putting people in sections they just consider this all up north. If you get anywhere up here, they're gonna just say you up north. Mm-hmm. And and so what um what what ended up uh, um taking you to the penitentiary? Um, what 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 eventually was you charged with that landed you in prison? Well, I had a, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a first degree murder, but it ended up breaking down the uh, manslaughter. Then we had a, I had a home invasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had I had two separate uh serious cases. They had a uh, had me at first for capital punishment. They was gonna try to uh to me for death penalty case, you know what I'm saying? But the man on this shirt right here had otherwise, he, he wasn't having that. That's why I represent this dude right here. His name is Manny Fresh. You know what I mean? That's my brother. He ain't here with me no more. But you mm. know what I mean? That was one of the losses that I felt when I was incarcerated that that hurt me to the core. Wow. You know my, what I mean? My, but my sincere condolences to you. He put up he put up some money, made sure I got the proper lawyer, you know what I mean? And uh I got me, a, I got me a deal. You know what I mean? I took a deal for 17 years. They took it down, broke it down to manslaughter. You know what I'm saying? But uh, make a long story short, you know what I mean? I was just young and dumb. You know what I mean? Me and a couple of my partners went out there thinking that we was doing something like I say, but we really wasn't even supposed to be doing at the time. Some shit happened. Shots was fired. Somebody didn't make it. Somebody got shot. You know what I mean? And, and here we go. You know what I mean? They sent me 17 years. You know what I mean? Like I say, it was three of us. You know what I mean? Three went in, three got out. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. We all on the streets. At the at the time at the time this happened, uh, how old were you? When it happened, I was twenty two. Twenty two. Well, and it happened. I, I got sentenced at twenty two. When it happened, I was twenty years old. It happened in two thousand. Right. And so the the other two uh, individuals who were your co defendants, had you been basically knowing them all your life? Had you had you guys grew up together? All our life, like you know what I mean, like literally, like my first gun I ever owned. Me and my co defendant, we was like that was it was ours. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I mean? So from the Sixth Avenue days with the the, the, the the all the way of finding myself, he played a part of my life. So you know what I mean? Like when we did our time, it was like it was like there was really three brothers right there. Right. And so now that you're more old and you're more mature, as you look back on it, like did I mean, because you said you've pretty much been gang banging all your life, but I guess the question that I'm trying to ask is did you ever really notice that you made a transition from, you know, 
uh, young young boy and juvenile to a to quote unquote gang member, or was this something that you had just been doing for so long? You know, hanging with these friends, and you know, did it did it seem like you like I say trans trans like crossed over to a gang member, or did you just grow up continuing to do you know what you had always been doing with, with the same friends you had been knowing all your life? I kind of, kind of just did everything I was supposed to be doing. I just kind of just got better at it. You know what I mean? We went from being little young homies to buying the double ups to now we got the little quarter ounces. You know what I mean? And now we got the zips. Now we got our own dope house after we used to see the homies with a dope house. So it was just like graduation, those steps. It was just like, it was like, you never can really see when it happened because if you was in it, it was just, it was just, it was just going to, hey, it was happening. It's like, like you couldn't see. I was 18 years old. I had my own dope house. You know what I mean? I was going through nine. See, I had a QP. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm really running with the work, you know what I mean? Like, I'm running with quarter keys and shit, like, I'm really, and I'm only 18 years old, so it was like, there was no teaching of that. It was just like, you know what I mean? Either you're going to figure it out, if this is your life, or if it's not your life, you're going to be sitting there behind that wall for doing some, making a mistake, and it's going to cost you. Right. I was good at hustling. I was a good hustler, bro. Like, I didn't go to jail for hustling. Like, if I'd have stayed in my lane, like, he told me, this man on his shirt used to tell me, you can't do both. You got to stay in one lane. You do one or the other. If I'd have stayed in the lane I was in, I probably wouldn't have went incarcerated, but I probably wouldn't be the man I am today then. You know what I mean? Because incarceration is what made the change. I probably wouldn't have made this change had I would have been stayed out here just doing the ripping and running and being the man I was before I went to the penitentiary. Right. So it's kind of yeah. like a give and take. And that's true because that's that's something that, you know, uh, my uncle, my older uncle, my older homies used to tell me too, man, uh, hustling and gang bang came, don't mix. You know, they say you can't you can't do them both, you know. And, and uh, but the reason why I asked that you realize or not that you had um joined the game because a lot of people who've never been in games they are often asked what makes a person join a game and so sometimes i try to explain that it's never really um it's never really a, a like a a known decision it's just that you know we we just graduate sometimes from from the things that we've been doing to things you know from things that we've been doing to now more criminal things and more criminal things it's never really a conscious decision and so that's why that's why i was asking and so now that you you know you locked up in the county jail, you you're facing um, you know you're you're facing all this time and stuff. What's your what's your process, your mental process going on at that time? In this mind frame right now, only thing I'm thinking about is you know what I mean. Like I I got myself into this, so it's like now how do I get myself out of it? You see right. what I'm saying? So it's like you know what I mean with with all my dignity intact, with my gangster still intact, with my with my moral still intact. You know what right. I mean? I wasn't in there thinking about how do I get out of it. Like who can I you know what I mean get down bad on? I'm thinking about if all I'm looking for is a release date. I never went in there thinking like I was just gonna walk out free. I just didn't want to get life. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So my lawyer, all his all his job to me, what I used to tell him is get us a deal that we can get out of here on. I was only 20 years old at the time. You see what I'm saying? So it was like my mind frame wasn't going in here trying to get out guilt innocent. I wasn't going in here playing with the people talking about I didn't do nothing. Y'all got me messed up. You see what I'm saying? So my mind frame was just coming back home to my family and trying to get a second chance and do this all over again. So what, what, um, excuse me, you said you was able to get a 17 year deal. And so what about, mm -hmm. um, your co-defendants? Was, was they able to get a similar deal? Yeah, it was all packaged it up. It was all packaged up. It was, uh, two 17 years and one 15 year. Cause, uh, one of my co-defendants was only on the, uh, on the murder case. He didn't have, he wasn't in on the home invasion. And then my other, me and my other little partner, we was on the home invasion together and the other one. So we was all, we was three on both of them. And then he was only on one. So the and, one that was on both of us, we got the 17, and the one that was by itself got 15. Okay. And so were you guys all relatively the same age? Uh, were you the youngest? Or who, who uh, what, what was basically the ages of, of everybody that was uh, your co-defendants? Two of us was around the same age, me and my little brother, BB, 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 Baby David. We was uh, the same age. And then my boy Moan, he was a little older than us. I mean, so he was a few years older than us. Mm -hmm. And so... You finally you take this time um you catch the chain what was that experience like you know what did, did you have older homies in there in the county jail with you that was telling you what to expect um on your first trip to the pen and and what was they telling you you know to expect yes i was and, and no disrespect to them but all that shit was bullshit because they was telling me off of their experiences of what they was going what they went through when they was in there and that really ain't no way to set you up for what you're going through because you may not have the same kind of experiences so it's like, yeah, they was in there trying to tell me the shit to do. Don't fuck with these people. Don't fuck with them people. But when I got in there, them was the people that was putting me on and lacing me and getting me together. You right. see what I'm saying? So it's like if I'd have listened to y'all, I'd have went in here with a bad rain frame, and then I would have been damn near missed out on some real lessons that I really needed to help me survive in there. So 
I had a couple OG homies in there that was trying to give me their best effort, but like I say, they was going off of what their experiences was in there. So that, you know, when I had to go in there, I had to figure out my own experiences. You know what I mean? So, and that and that's a good point that you made, man. Because a lot of times when you have youngsters who have never went to the pen, you have older dudes telling them what to do and what not to do. And you made a great point, but sometimes when they tell you what not to do, that's based on on the things they experienced, and they may not be telling you why they had certain experiences. Maybe they was up there doing something they shouldn't have been doing. Yes. But they, yes. they, don't tell, they don't tell us that part. So if they, they only give mind, you the one side of the coin. They only give you the one side of the coin. They're not going to tell you the reason why what happened to them happened. They just tell you what happened, but they're not going to tell you why it happened. Right. So who were some of the individuals they told you kind of not to, to shy away from, not to, uh, you know, not to deal with? Well, it was really just more or less like, you know what I mean, because of, I'm from Sacramento, you know, I'm from up north, you know what I mean? So it was more or less like, you know what I mean, try to stay away from the paperwork, you know what I mean, try to stay away from that down south politics, you know what I mean? Everybody tell me about basically what L.A. and the L.A. don't like the up north and this and that and the third. So it kind of had my mind frame on some, you know what I mean, I'm going here. If you ain't from Sac and you ain't from Old Park, I really ain't, you know what I mean, don't want no parts of you. Right. But when I went in there, that was not that was not the way I was in. That was not who I was received. Okay. I was received by open arms by the homies from down south. They opened their arms and embraced me on some what's up with the homie. And it was always homie love. It was none of the shit that I was expecting coming from what I was told. Right. So so you basically referring to the down south bloods. They, you know, they embraced yes. you and every, it was all love. Yes, it was from the beginning to the end. OG Frog, Dynamite. Oh, yeah. Come on, man. You know, what I mean, my boy Tick, you know what I mean? Come on, man. We was up in that Tehachapi, man. I promise you, Big Preach. Come on, man. Big Bam. Like, I promise you, them is OGs all from down south that when I came through the door, they didn't care about what part of the world I was from. You were blood. Let's go. Yeah. And so so when you left the county jail uh, and you went to to, uh, to reception, you just said, I guess, to Hatchby, that was the first prison that you hit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to my nigga Mooney, West Side L gang. You know what I mean? My boy Tick. You know what I mean? Them is all the dudes was my cellies or had a part of my first bill I ever meant to when I came to prison. I didn't know nothing about nothing. Brody fresh off the bus from reception center right. all the way into Hatchby. You know what I mean? All I know is that I'm in this prison and this is where it gets serious at now. Mm -hmm. And so and what, embrace me. what year was it when you hit when you hit your first prison? 2002. 2002. Uh, September. I got there September 2002. And then from from reception center for those who of those of you guys who don't know, reception center is basically where they'll send convicts to get housed. Um, just briefly so they can get uh, assessed and then um, figuring out where they want to go in terms of, you know, security and stuff like that. So what what main line, what was the first main line prison that you hit? Uh, Tracy, when I first got, that was my reception was Tracy. So and, I got Tracy I, reception, then I went to Tehachapi, and after Tehachapi, oh, I went to Corbin. Okay. Okay. Our reception was Tracy. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, Tehachapi was your first main line then? Yeah, yeah, Tehachapi was the first main line I hit Tracy from reception off of Tracy. And so what was that like? Uh, was, how long was you there be before you seen some type of uh, incident, whether it be violence or whatever that, you know, that was an eye opener that made you realize, OK, you know, uh, this place is real. Shit, when I first got off the bus, Brody, when we first got off the bus, when we got in them cages, uh -huh. we was off the bus. Like you say, they mingling everybody fresh off this bus. So every race going in this cage. And when we got in that cage, you see the Mexican come whisper to the Mexicans. And all of a sudden, the Mexicans is in the corner of the cage. And he seen right. a black come listen to a black, and he come tell all the blacks, let's get over here in this cage. Now we realize we just got to a yard that the Mexicans and the blacks on the fresh lockdown. Mm, and we okay. all in this cage together, you know what I'm saying? So it, it can get spunky real fast. You start seeing everybody's body change, the moves, and it just was it was just a, a different feeling. It was just tension immediately out of nowhere. Right. Because what we walked into. And so uh, was there ever, did you ever get involved in any type of like riots or stuff like that at, at the Hatchaby? Nah, 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 because they had us on lockdown. So when we came off that lockdown, they tried to open up one building. And the building that they tried to open up, it went down again. So they just shipped us out of there. They put us uh, they put us in Corcoran. They moved us up out of there and went to Corcoran. And that's how I, I had one of the, the best two years of my life in the penitentiary. Okay, so <laughs> a lot of people may find that odd. You say it was the best two years of your life in the penitentiary. So let mm -hmm. us know what, what, what was so good about it. What, why, why was it the best two years of your life? Cause it was a reunite. It was a reunite. A reunite. I got to reunite with my brother, the same one I told you I was following behind the idolized. He left the streets in '97. You know what I mean? He went to the penitentiary in '97. So now this is 2003. We left up out of Tehachapi in 2002. Get there 2003. So many years that went past, and I ain't got to put them. I ain't got to see my brother. So I got to land on the yard where my brother was at, and me and my brother were sellies, and 
mind you, I'm only like eight months into my prison term and I got 16 more years to go. Mm. See what I'm saying? So it's like now my teacher is my brother. Right. The person I'm going to learn everything I really need to know. So all the shit that the OGs really was trying to protect me from, I really ain't got to worry about that now for my teacher because my teacher is my brother, the same mama, same daddy. So that was that was like I couldn't I don't think I could have survived the way I survived prison my whole term with the with the the, the way I did it. If it was my teacher wasn't him, because I would have probably questioned some of the things I learned from the individuals. I would wonder what they hit the agenda might have been because everybody got an agenda they push in the penitentiary. You know and I know. Right. See what I'm saying? So you would have been questioning what they tell you. And you would have been rightfully so. You should have been, but not from him. This is the same last name as mine. His right. mom and daddy is the same mom and daddy as me. So, and, you know what I mean? That was and, my first two. That was my best training I could have got. And, and a lot of times, you know, I'll I'll get comments like people to ask me, um, you know, have I ever seen, you know, father and son, brother and brother in prison? And so, um, you know, because if you're going to be in prison, man, who better to be in prison with than somebody that you really trust, as sad as it may be, but it's someone mm -hmm. that you really trust, someone who knows has your best interest at heart, man. And so mm -hmm. when you so you got you got shipped to this prison just because a riot jumped off in another building. Did you have any idea before you got there? Your brother was there. Yeah, because uh, he already already been on Corkin, but he was on another yard. But he knew that they was opening up that yard that they, you know, because prison talk, you know, that shit just words go to rumbling. So they right. knew that that C yard was going to be opened up for a, a level four. So he knew that that I was in level four. So he said that if I can find a way to get up there with him, he was we because we corresponded. We had a letter thing. You know what I mean? Like we mm -hmm. went to the counselor, signed up before we was in the prison together. You know what I mean? So I went to the counselor, told him my brother's in a pen over here. They made sure we was really brothers, and they made it to where I could send him a letter straight through the mailbox from my cell to the prison and then to, to get to his prison in the mail system. Oh, okay. So I had to write him and communicate with him and stuff. So he used to just always tell me, because like I said, I'm his baby brother. Now I'm in the pen, so he's trying to protect me from as far as way. So he right. made sure we can communicate through letters, and he told me to get up there. And they put Quirkin on the wall, and I signed my name up, and they sent me there. Mm -hmm. Well... Wow. And so how long, how long had it, how long had it been since you had seen your brother? Since 97. And and so you ran across. That's about five group. years. That was about five, five years. years. About five wow. years had passed. Right. You know what I mean? And that, that was, that was with me being on the streets and him calling home for packages and me sending him stuff. So he'd get a little family visits and sending the shoes through the boxes. And you know what I mean? I did everything I was supposed to do as a little brother. You know what I mean? When I got in the cell with him, he tried to give me half everything he had. Like he felt like he owed me that. And I told him, Everything I did for you was because that's what I was supposed to do. I'm your brother. You don't owe me nothing, bro. Right. You know what I mean? And we just rocked it out. We just sat in that cell. We just had fun. We rocked it out. Yeah. He laced me up. My first ride I ever got in in prison, I was in the, my brother was my, in the cold thing. He never went to child. My brother worked back there, so he never went to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And this morning, I'm standing at the door waiting to get out, and he just hopped up and just put his shoes on like, I'm going to breakfast this morning. And that's that same morning, I swear to God, after the ride happened in the, in the breakfast line. And me and my brother were side by side, activated. So now before this, before this popped off this riot, what, what were some of the things that your brother, uh, you know, was able to teach you hands on about being locked up and being in prison? Really just awareness, man, about the making sure you always aware of your, your surroundings, like, you know, what I mean, survival, observation is survival. You know what I'm saying? So I used to be sleep. You know what I mean? Like that was my big thing. I was I, I'm going to sleep, bro. I'm not going to be worried about my bed rolled up. I'm not watching no door. Basically, you stand up to watch the door and that door ain't going to open. But he used to get me out of that, like, stay out, get out this bed, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you can't be sleeping. Roll right. your mat up, bro. Do some working out, bro. Like, stay in shape. Like, you know what I mean? You got to you gotta be mentally even strengthened. You got to be ready because at any time he didn't have the pen in his arm and poke me up while I'm laying in the bed, make me get the pen out of his hand. You know what I mean? Like, man, if I had something, you would sleep. What you was going to do? Right. You know what I mean? So he really trained me. Like, he would he would toughen me up. And that's still the same kind of training I had on the streets when I was a little kid. I went through that as a grown man with my brother in the cell. He toughened right. me up. He tightened me up up in that cell to make sure his little brother was ready for that yard if I wasn't here. And like you say, man, being on a level four, um, it's extremely dangerous. And at any given moment, a life situation could 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 jump off that doesn't directly affect you, but could indirectly affect you. And so you had a teacher. And that's cool, man, because a lot of people don't know it's an extremely huge difference coming from the pen gang, I mean, coming from the streets gang banging, but now being in prison when everything is much more, um, it's much more, it's, it's a lot right of things. There. Yeah, a lot of things are, have to do with numbers and racial, racial tension and stuff like that, man. And so, yeah, you de that definitely, that definitely had to be a blessing. And so, um, now you said you guys end up getting into a riot. So who, um, who was the riot? 
who was the who who was the riot with? And then so I guess, of course, you know, because sometimes when a riot jumps off, it's tension in the air. But from the way you made it seem that particular day, it was it was it wasn't any tension in the air and something just sporadically happened in the in the kitchen. Yep, we was in that chow hall, man, and, and and it's like I don't know how, like I say, my body just knew something was wrong. Like I couldn't had to have no appetite, Brody. Like I just didn't feel like I wanted to eat nothing. But on the way to chow, it was like, man, I can't wait to go to breakfast. You know, you wake up in the morning, you hungry. When I walked right. through that door, it was just so quiet up in there, bro. It was just like this ain't normal, bro. Like ain't nobody talking to normal the same people that used to say what's up to you in the morning, head nods, ain't none of them going right. on right now. Like something ain't right, bro. So we 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 go to the table and shit, you know what I mean? It's fog line, so they've been had to. It's fog line, so like I mean, they only letting out section at a time. So it's people that been in there eating already. So now this is a fresh group of people coming here to eat, but this group of people that's in here ain't leaving until we eat now because the chow hall's full. It's fog line. We got to go back all as a unit. Boom. So we second half in there. We eating. We sitting around like it just ain't normal. Something ain't right. So the homie get up. We dump our trays. Boom. We go out to the fog line. The homie walk back to the line and say, "Look, check this out." When it's, this is that's how I went to say when this line start moving, everything white we getting on it. No explanation, ain't no this what happened. Check this out. I found out what happened when we was in the hole, just like that. That's how my first ride to be. When this line start moving, little bro, anything white that's close, we getting it. That's it. And he pushed right. on to the front of the line. He passed that message along. And as soon as that motherfucking police said, All right, let's go, and it went all bad. <laughs> so everybody with it getting cracking. Let me ask you a question for the people that's never been incarcerated. How many um how many people do you think that child hall held? It's probably a, it's 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 a half a tier to me, so that gotta be at least a, a hundred people. It's, it's it's twenty what is it, twenty-five cells on the bottom, twenty-five cells on the top. Right. You know what I mean? You coming from we we at this time we in this corker, this is a two seventy design, so it's a level four, but it's two seventy, so it's a real whole building. It's not like a 180. It's not no sections. It ain't like five doors at the bottom, five at the top. It's the whole tier from one to 17 on the bottom, 17 to 25 on the bottom. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everybody doubled up and they sell. We out here in this it was deep. We was deep. Right. And so uh, the whole point of me asking you that question was, can you can you describe, man, for the for the viewers, the the eerie feeling that you get? You can tell, you know, even though you don't know what's going on. Your body can sense that something in this Mickey Ficky ain't right, man. And, and it's it's yes. just uh it's a it's an extremely nervous feeling, and you know, it's just because like like he said, man, it's damn near a hundred people in there and anything can happen. So can you explain the feeling of just you know, you didn't know what was going on, but something told you from going up in that child hall on a daily basis, something was going on. So what what's that feeling like, man? You know how when you're on them, like, really like a roller coaster, bro, like when that motherfucker take you to the top and then you finna get the, you finna go in, it's like the bottom of your stomach, you like, you don't know what that feeling is, but it's like, it's something, but you just like, it was something in the bottom of my stomach, bro. Like you say, it was an eerie feeling, like ain't nobody talking, bro. All them people in this child hall and it's quiet. Quiet in prison civilized the problem. Right. Normally you walk through the child hall, you hear the house, child hall as you're approaching it. Because everybody in here yelling and screaming about something. It was quiet. That whole first half, like they were just sitting there, just like they ready to get up and get it, they ready to get to it. 